Good morning. What a blessed day to be alive and in the house of the Lord. This morning we were with our leaders backstage. This is what we do at 9 o'clock on Sundays. We gather together and we pray for the people, for the services, for our children, for the volunteers. And more than everything, we just seek the face of the Lord and we just are letting him know that we need him. That we need him. And while we were praying, I felt something that the Lord has put on my heart that I'll be sharing. I prepared another message for this morning, but that message is in my back office. And I, I'm just here with the word of God right here. And we're just going to read a few things that the Lord has put on my heart that I believe it's for all of us. And we're going to pray and we're going to worship him. Amen. If I was to give a title to this message, I would entitle it, I want it. I want it. And this should be the desire and the hunger of our hearts. Whatever what it is, God, you have for me, I want it. I want it. It's not just a desire that's in my heart, but it's also a prayer. It is a cry that comes from my inner being that I want it, whatever what you have for me. During the time whenever when Jesus was here on earth and he was walking on this earth, he saw a lot of need. He saw a lot of broken people. He saw a lot of, a lot of young people, a lot of children that were just playing around and, and walking around. But he saw also a crowd of people that they were lost. And the Bible says that he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep with no pasture. They were people that seemed like outside maybe they had it all together. They put a smile on their face. They were running around. They were kicking the rocks or whatever what they were doing. Singing the songs. But Jesus saw the depths of the heart of human. Of humanity. There was thirst and hunger and pain. And nothing changed from that time till today. There are so many people that are still walking with thirsty hearts. With the hearts full of pain. With the hearts full of confusion. And you might be even here today or watching online. And it may be the things that you've been praying for a long time, but it seems like you're not getting the answers. It seems like when you were hoping for good news, the bad news is coming in that moment. When you were thinking that around the corner, I'm going to just achieve and I'm going to overcome these things in my life. Unexpectedly, you receive something else that comes against you. And there is one thing after another, but Jesus knows your heart. And we have a purpose as brothers and sisters, as believers, as the church of Jesus Christ. We're not just existing on this earth, but we have a purpose to please him and to walk with him, to embrace his promises and to love our Lord and Savior. And one of the things that Jesus says in John chapter 14, verses 12 and down, if you have the Bibles with you, if you can open up with me, the book of John Chapter 14, or if you have devices, John 14, verse 12 and down. Jesus says these words, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, say with me today. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus, the Son of God, he came to the temple and he read the scripture and he said, today, not tomorrow, we're going to hope for something. Not the promises from yesterday and the law and the things, the rituals that we used to do that could not obtain the, the presence of the Lord. But he says, today, the scripture is fulfilled. The power of God that stands in front of you. Today is the time for the blind to have sight. Today is the time for the captives to be free. It's today, not tomorrow, not yesterday. It's today. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And one of the prayers that we were praying, God, take us deeper in your presence. 
God gave us authority when we speak your word for there to be weight in our words. God give us the anointing and the unctions of the Holy Spirit. That when, whenever when we lay hands upon each other and we pray for one another. That there will be power that will come from above. And God will answer our prayer. Why? Because today this scripture was fulfilled. And for that reason we walk in that power. We walk in that authority. Today we can cry out to the Lord and say, Father, if you have done this in the past, you can do this today again. We can pray in faith and come to him in boldness for our families, for our marriages, for our children. Today he can answer. He can open the eyes of the blind. He can heal the sick and he can give liberty to those that are captive. Because that's why he came to this earth. He did not come just for us to sit on empty or, 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 or empty cushions and be like, this is just my cushion here. This is just my chair and this is very comfortable for me. No, he did not call us to do that. But he calls us to take authority, to take authority in prayer, to take authority in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ and to proclaim victory over our families, victory over our children, victory over our communities. Enough is enough. The Lord has given us the power and the authority to do that and come in boldness into his presence. Why do I say that? Well, open up with me another scripture that is written. John chapter 14, verse 12 and down. Did I say that in the past? It was the book of Luke. That was Luke chapter 4. That's what happens when you have a message right before you get up here, right? But John chapter 14, verse 12 and down says this now. Most assuredly I say to you. He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. My brother, my sister, this is what the word of God says. It's not that we have made that up. This is what the word of God says. Most assuredly, I say to you, I say to you with confidence in other words. I'm assuring you, I'm reminding you of something. And I say to you, he who believes in me. In different words, if you have become a born again believer, if me and you are a follower of Jesus Christ, now the things that Jesus Christ did, they belong to us as well. Amen. And he says this, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than this he will do because I go to my father and whatever you ask in my name, what I will do that the father may be glorified in the son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. You see, sometimes we just take the scripture out of the context and we say, whatever what I'm going to ask, he's going to give it to me. As long as I ask him in his name. Father, give me a million dollars. Of course not. But I just pray that. No, he says over here, whatever what you ask in this prayer, the purpose is for the father to be glorified. There is no gain to me or to you. But there is one purpose and one purpose alone, for your name to be glorified. Whenever when I pray for my children to walk with the Lord, it is for your name to be glorified. Because he desires more than me and you put together for our children to walk with him. Amen. He loves them more than we do and how much more he cares for them. And that's why he's saying the purpose when we come to him. And when we're doing the works of the Lord, and he said that the, the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit, when we become born again, it's inside of us. And when we pray according to his will, and when we pray in his name, he hears us. And he says that you will be doing not just my works, but greater works that I have done. For what purpose? For my father to be glorified. It's a shame that the day we live in, so many, so many preachers so-called, we've touched the glory of God. We have made shows of the things that were supposed to bring glory to, to his name. We have made conferences, we have made shows, we have made all of the entourage, all the cameras, and we have done all those things. We don't walk through the hospitals, we don't walk through the streets to do that. We wanna put 10 cameras and we wanna put all of those things in front of people because we wanna touch a little bit of that glory. 
But he says, no, this glory belongs to the Lord. If me and you have a heart desire in our hearts, in the depths of our hearts to say, Father, glorify your name one more time. Whatever what we ask, he will give it to us. Because the same power that Jesus had, we have it and we will have it at our workplace. We will have it when we drive. We will have the compassion and the prayer life, whatever where we are. It doesn't have to be a form. And most of all, I'm going to tell you, we're going to maybe shine from all of these things that in public and we're going to be more private to impact people. Why? Because there is one hunger and one desire alone, Father, that your name will be glorified. Your name will be glorified. Have you ever wondered sometimes maybe why God is not doing certain things? Maybe because we want to touch the glory and we want to take a little bit of credit. But no, the heart desire should be, Father, you glorify your name. You glorify your name. It's not how much I prayed. It's not how wonderful I am. It's not how wonderful the people around me are. But it's how wonderful you are. And how wonderful your works are. And my hunger, desire is for your name to be glorified. And then later on in verse 15, he continues, says this. If you love me, keep my commandments. It's, it's only one context that he's talking about. If you love me, oh, Father, but I came, I came to you and I'm asking you things in your name, but nothing is happening. But what about fulfilling the commandments of the Lord? What about me and you walking in the word of God? What about us embracing what God calls holy, we call it holy. What God calls a sin, we call it a sin. There is no gray line. What about embracing the truth of the word of God and standing upon it and say, no, I love you, O oh Father. If you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray that the Father and he will give you another helper. Meaning, he was saying that my time is going to come. I'm going to be going home to heaven, but I'm going to send you another helper, which is the Holy Spirit. Praise be to God. It's in this context he's talking about that he may abide with you forever. Forever. Not at only uh, in a few moments, for five minutes, for ten minutes, even the lowest of lows of moments in your life. If you become born again believers, the Holy Spirit is calling you. Yes, we may grieve him, but he still loves you and he's calling you because he abides within us forever. Forever. Verse 17, the spirit of truth. You see, his spirit is truth in our life. He will guide us in all truth. There is no confusion there, but he will guide us in all truth. Whom the world cannot, whom the world cannot receive, because it's neither seen him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells within you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And this is the promise of the Lord to us, that he will not leave me and you orphans. He will not leave me and you in the moments when we are coming to him in prayer. For whatever what we have, the needs and, and whatever what we're praying for. He says, no, but I am going to answer you. You're not alone. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. You have the power and the authority to call upon the name of the Lord. And to say, devil, you have no more place in this person's life. Devil, you have no more place in my children's lives. You cannot play with their minds. You cannot play with their emotions. You cannot play with their gender. You cannot play with everything that is going on in this world. In the name of Jesus, let the blood of Jesus Christ and the sprinkling blood of Jesus be upon our homes, upon our families, upon our children. Let the power of the Holy Ghost lead us and guide us. And this is our heart desire. And he says, if he did these things, we will do them also even more so. And then whenever when we ask him in his name, he will grant it to us. Why? Because he desires to be glorified. And this should be our heart desire to be glorified. To be glorified. It's not in our might or in our power. But it's the power of the Holy Spirit. And in his power, we walk. We breathe. We, we talk. We have our being. And it's through him and in him. Praise be to God. What are some of the things that we are praying for? What are some of the things that we are waiting the Lord to answer? 
What are some of the things that you might be going through, your loved ones, your family, your children, your community, your neighbors? What are some of the things that, that you're aware of, but it seems like I'm so helpless. I can't do anything. Today, today, let this be the prayer. God, I want it. I want it one more time. One more time for this to be my testimony, that you have moved in my life, that you have answered my prayer. And I got this message while we were praying for our family here in this church. That we can rise up together. That we can believe for our children. That we can rise up and say, Father, have your way. Devil, you cannot have them. You cannot have them. They belong to you. Me and my house will serve the Lord. Praise be to God. And my last scripture before we go in prayer is the book of Acts chapter 3 verse 1 and down. The book of Acts chapter 3 verse 1 and down says this. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man lamed from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gates of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. You see, in different words, there was somebody that was lame. That was brought up daily there. Which tells me that there was daily people going to the temple. In the hour of prayer to pray to seek the Lord. But nobody could have helped them. Can you imagine there were people that were coming to pray. Like we do today. We come here to pray. And there is a need. And it seems like nobody has the power to answer to the need. That's what it seems like. Right? Right? But no, if we have the power of God, the Holy Spirit, we can come in boldness and pray. We can come in boldness to him and pray. And over here it says, verse 3, Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask for alms. And fixing his eyes on him, with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. You see, people... Sometimes that are broken people, sometimes that are in need. They're so in pain that, that they look at us now. They look at us, to me and to you. What can I receive? A little strength to go forward. What can I receive? But you see, I was talking about people that don't touch the glory of God. People that know who to point to. You see, we are nothing without Christ. We are lost without Christ. We are nothing without Him. But over here it says, when they looked at him, he says, listen, don't look at me. Don't look at Pavel. Don't look at me. No, no, the moment you're going to look at me, you're going to get depressed. You're going to fall. You're going to get disappointed. You're going to be, oh, my goodness. But no, I'm going to put you to Jesus. This is what I do. I've talked with many of you in this church. Through the things, obstacles, hardships in life, I always point you to Jesus. Because I know that I'm limited in my capacity. But Jesus has the answers. Jesus has the answers. And over here it says that he looked at them, expecting to receive something from man. Verse 6, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give it to you. You see, the problem is that in the day we live in, we do have a lot of silver and gold. But what we need to have, we lack. We lack. We lack. Can it be that sometimes the things of the world that overwhelmed us and we are so comfortable. And there's nothing wrong with having things. I like having things. But if they blind us and drives us away from where the power belongs, we are in trouble. We're in trouble. You see, the disciples did not have a whole lot of things. But they had the most important thing. And then he looked at them and says, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand. And lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankles, bones received strength. So he leaping, meaning jumping and dancing, stood and walked and entered the temple. You see, the miracle took place outside the temple. Outside the temple. This is exactly what I was sharing a little bit before. It was not when 10 cameras were set up and the best shots were going to be taken. Whenever when the prayer moment is going to come. It was not in that moment. 
It was before. It was before the temple. Before, before they came in. And the testimony now came to the house of the Lord. Oh God. Oh God, help us to understand that we can lay hands on people where we are at work. Help us understand that we can stop if we feel led to the, to the person that is outside, maybe searching for something or asking for bread or for whatever what is going on in their life, that we have the power and the authority to stop and say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus, let the provision of God come into your life. And then we can bring them to church so we can rejoice together. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they're looking, who is this? Who is this person? They're disturbing the service. Who is this person over here? They didn't notice him. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gates of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement in what had happened to him. This was the reaction of the people. They looked and they were with, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, what just happened? Who does this? Can you imagine? Maybe they thought, could have I had the same power and authority to do the same thing? Could have I prayed for that person? Could, have, could I just laid hands and say, in the name of Jesus? Because it's, it's all what it takes. It's not us who does, who do it. It is the power of God. We just walk in obedience. Father, glorify your name. If you want to glorify your name through this miracle, do it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Peter did not come with John. And he says, hold on, the service is over. I have a testimony. Look what I've done. Look what God has done through us. No. But, but it did not happen. They all walked. And this guy is just rejoicing. And later on he says this in Verse 11, now, as the lame man who was held, who was healed, held to Peter and John, and the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us? As though by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus. You see, and this I'm going to stop over here. I'm bringing back to what I've shared in the last passage. That whenever when we come and we ask things in his name, in that context, he says, for him to be glorified. It's one purpose. Whenever when we ask for things, whenever when we ask for miracles, whenever when we ask for God to answer our prayers, it's not a selfish thing even though we want it, but deeper, deeper in our hearts should be God glorify your name. And this is exactly what he's saying. Why are you looking at me? Do you think I have special access? Do you think I'm more godly than you? Do you think that I have deserved it? Do you think I have special power? This is what Peter and John are responding to the people. In different words, you're believers. He said, don't look at us, but God, our Father. This is one purpose why he done it, to glorify his servant, Jesus. You see, the miracle happened for him to be glorified. For him to be glorified. And then he continues, whom you delivered up and denied the presence of, in the presence of Pilate, whom he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for the murderers, to be granted to you and kill the prince of life whom God raised from the dead, hallelujah, of which we are witnesses. Praise be to God. Now he's looking at them and says, are you the ones that, that you crucified him? Are you the ones that maybe you have the, 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 the godliness in front of you in a sense of the form of godliness but denying its power? You're the one that, that cried out and, and crucified him, but he rose again. And that Jesus he is the one that touched this man. Praise be to God. He is the one that healed him, not me and not our godliness. Verse 16. And his name, through faith, in his name has made this man strong, whom you've seen and known. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness 
in the presence of you all. Not just healing, but soundness. In different words, God made him whole. God made him whole. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. The faith that comes through him. My brother, my sister, we're going to be praying. We're going to pray for our children, for our families, and for our marriages right now. And it's not how wonderful we are. It's not because we have deserved it or because we're so godly, but because God has promised us that the same works that he has done, we will do them also, even more so, even more so. For what reason? For his name to be glorified. For his name to be glorified. And whatever what it is, God, let your name be glorified. In whatever prayers we're coming before him, God, let your name be glorified. God, I don't see it. How are you going to do it? I, I see disaster. I see destruction. I don't know, God, my hands are down. I can't do it. But would you glorify your name? Would you glorify your name? There is a generation. There is a generation, especially in the day we live in. The other day I was talking with somebody on the phone. And also in person. And one question they're asking me, they're asking me, you're serving now as a pastor in the American community. You're serving now in the multicultural church. One of the questions, do you guys have youth in your services? Where is the youth in America? Where is the youth in the churches of America? Many churches through COVID, they began to stream where there were thousands of people. I was talking with a pastor from Seattle. They said, multi-thousands of people, three or 5,000 people church. After COVID, when COVID was coming down now, maybe 200 people were gathering together. Churches are empty. In different words, there's also younger people, they don't want to come to church. For one reason or another, they got complacent. The idea of serving the Lord lightly. The idea of serving the Lord with one foot in the church and the other foot doing whatever what you want to do. There is no conviction of living a holy life before the Lord. There is no conviction to walk upright before the Lord. There is a problem in this nation and around the world, my brother, my sister. There is a problem, but let me tell you something. This problem, Jesus can fix it. Jesus can fix it through the power of the cross and the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a whole generation that are at the temple gates of the church. We can come here and we pray and we praise and we do all of these things. But there's a whole generation that are crying out, they're handicapped, they don't have the strength to go forward. But we have been commanded to lay hands and pray for people. We have been commanded to pray for the younger generation. We have been commanded to pray for our youth that are confused about their gender. It's a spirit of demonic that is going on around the world. But God has not given us a, pure, a, a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. Do we believe it this morning? Do we believe it this morning with all of our heart? That God, even though I'm going to knock and pray as last week I, I've shared with you, even though I don't see the answer, but I'm still going to pray. I'm still going to knock till I have breath in my lungs because they belong to you. This generation belongs to you. Give me the power and the authority that I need. Give me the strength that I need. Encourage me, God, that I don't walk past to come to the house of the Lord when I look and there's broken people all around me. Oh, God, give me a heart for them. Give me a love for them. Baptize me with your presence one more time. I want it today. I want it today. A few weeks ago, Pastor Nick preached, God, teach me how to love better. Teach me to love you better and teach me to love people better. We can do better, my brothers and my sisters. And we can do it again through the power of the Holy Spirit. I speak these things with pain. I speak these things because I have a concern. I speak the things because I'm looking ahead and I know 
that we cannot get a hold of this generation with bells and whistles, smoke and lights. We cannot get a hold of them. But let me tell you even more. We can't get a hold of them in our own power and strength to think that in our own godliness, in our own prayer moment, that we think that we're so godly and we so deserve it, like, like Peter and John says. Do you think we've done this by our own godliness or our own power? You're mistaken. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. One problem of extremism is we go so far left that we allow all these things to keep the congregation. And another problem is we go so far to the other side that we think that with our own power and godliness, we can keep this generation. And both of them are wrong. Both of them are wrong. It is the cross. It is Jesus Christ. It is his love. It is his mercy. It is his power. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. And we will spend more time in prayer than judging and talking negatively and talking all of these things, how wrong everybody is, but we are right. I think we'll have more effect in this generation. But today I have a hunger and I have a desire to pray God one more time. One more time, would you do it? Would you do it today? Would you do it today? Would you do it today? I'm convinced more and more. And lately I can't shake it off. I can't shake it off. That it has to be the power of God. If not, there's no point of doing this or what we do. It has to be his power. It has to be his keeping power. It has to be. It has to be. And my brother and my sister, by God's grace, it will be. Because we don't belong to ourselves, the Bible says. But we belong to him. We have been bought with a price. No longer I live in my flesh for the flesh. <laughs> but I live for him and for his purposes. I have been bought. I belong to you. Jesus, have your way in my life. Have your way in my life. And now when I come to you in prayer, I have confidence that you hear me. I have confidence that you hear me. And before we pray, I'm going to say this. Parents, I beg you. Would you lay your hands on your children and pray? In the morning when you wake up. In the evening when you go to sleep. When they're sleeping already. Sometimes I do that. When they're sleeping already. I come upstairs and I put my hands on my little ones and I pray for them. You can do the same. And thank God maybe you are doing that. I just want to encourage you to continue to do that. There's power and authority in that. Don't quit. Oh, maybe my, my son or my daughter is already 20 years old. So what? So what? Are we so embarrassed now? We became so proper now that we can't say, son, daughter, come over here. And in a moment, to say, I just want to pray for you. I just want to lay hands on you and pray for you. When I do weddings, I talk with parents. And usually parents are, are just aside and everything is about the bride and the groom. And I tell the parents, when I pray for them, you have the power and the right and the same authority that I do right now to come and pray for your children. They're your children. So if you want to join me to the hands of them, you can do that. Those are our children. We can bless them. We can believe for them. We can believe one more time for God to get a hold of them. Let us not be ashamed. Let us not be ashamed to cry out to the Lord. Let us not be ashamed of those things. Some of us, including me, we have very small children. We have very small, five, seven years old, 10 years old. And at this age, yeah, they're a little mischievous, but, but overall, they're obedient. They walk, they do everything what we ask them to do. They're perfect. They're perfect. But I want to remind us, let's think ahead. Let's think a little bit when they're 18. Let's think about whenever when they're a little bit older to get their phones. Let's think about whenever when they start dating. Let's think about when they go to college, when they go to school. Oh, my brother, my sister, we live in a broken world. We live in a broken world. That soon, it's a whole generation. They're finding themselves at the gates. Can you imagine what the guy was thinking? Every day, there are people going to pray, but there's no power in it. And there's a whole generation. I was reading an article, and they were saying about this younger generation, that they're so authentic that they want something real. They want something real. It's not that they're so rebellion. It's because they're disappointed. They want something real. They want something real. And me and you are the real thing. We are the real deal. We are those people that can lead by example. Pray and believe. Hallelujah. 
Don't be ashamed. Don't draw back. Cry out to the Lord for our children to go to school, for our college students, for our families, for our marriages. Today I was watching my daughter. I took even the video, a little bit of my phone, and I videotaped for a moment. But during worship, she saw what parents are doing, and she just lifted her hands, and she began to praise, and she looks, and then she claps, and she looks around again, and I even told Pastor Nick, look at her. And you might say, well, it's a child. Yes, let the children come to the Lord. But let me tell you something. It's the work of the Holy Spirit, obviously, it's already working in their lives, but also they're looking at us. They're looking at us, like Peter and John said, look at us. And we are to tell the generation, look at us, look at us. And when they look at us, we tell them, we don't have what it takes for you to have what you're needing, but we know who possess it. We know who possess it because it's the power of the Holy Spirit and it's Him. And it's Him. We point people to Jesus Christ. Amen? Would you stand with me? If this message spoke to you in any way, would you respond to these altars? Would you respond to this place in whatever capacity? I was obedient to share this word that I felt the Lord put it in my heart before the service when we were in a prayer time with our leadership. And I don't know if it's for you online or for you here, mother, father, who's struggling with your children, who's struggling with your marriage. I don't know for who this word is. But let me tell you something. When we come in prayer and we lay hands and we pray, there's power in it. There's power in it. And we're going to believe the Lord to say, God, what you promised me you're going to do, you can do it. God, what you did more than 2,000 years ago, you had given me the Holy Spirit. He says, now you're not orphans. You're not alone, but I am with you. And whatever what you ask, I'll grant it to you for one purpose, for his name to be glorified. For his name to be glorified. And if the Lord spoke to you in any capacity, just come here, join me. I'll be here as well, joining with you. And we're going to be praying. We're going to believe the Lord. We're going to believe the Lord. Eternity is too long. Eternity is too long for me and for you to kind of be careless about. But we are called for a bigger mission and bigger purpose. Father, I pray now that you would do only what you can do. As we lift our voices to you and pray to you for this generation and for these children, for our children, would you hear us from heaven? Would you hear us, O oh God? Forgive us, O oh Lord, that we have thought that with our own godliness and our own power, we can make them a certain, certain human beings that they will belong to you. God, forgive us. It's not by might, it's not by strength, nor by power, but by the power of the Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit, by your power, God. We call upon your name now. Jesus. Jesus. Father, I'm pointing people to you the best I can. Glorify your name now. Glorify your name, O oh Lord. I pray that you would give us authority in our words when we speak. Father, I pray that there will be weight to our words. Father, I pray that when we pray for our children, when we pray for our marriages, when we pray for our spouse, when we lay hands upon each other, that there will be power coming from above. This is not just rituals that we're doing, but this is something sacred that you have commanded us to do. And I pray, oh God, that you would give us the boldness, the boldness that we need this morning to believe for the impossible. One more time, God. One more time would you pour out your spirit. One more time would you do this among us. And you get the glory. And you get the honor. One more time, oh Father. Would you do it? Do it again, oh Father. Do it again. In the mighty name of Jesus. 
Would you heal the sick in the name of Jesus? Would you give sight to the blind in the name of Jesus? Would you set the captives free in the name of Jesus? Would you get hold of this generation in the United States of America and around the world? Would you get a hold of our children, our youth, oh God Almighty? Fill our churches, oh Father. Fill your church with all the young, middle age, and children because this is what a healthy church is. It's not just for the elderly and it's not just an entertainment for the young. But it's a place where we can come and worship. It's a place where we can come and meet with you face to face. It's a place where we can come and cry out to you. And nothing matters, oh Father. Not the lights, not the smoke, not all of the things that we think that we can have power in it. God forgive us, oh Lord. But the power belongs to the Lord. We come to you in the name of Jesus. And we're asking you to hear us from heaven and heal this land, oh Father. We humble before you. We humble before you, O oh God. Put a cry in our hearts, O oh Father, to believe one more time. Put a cry in our hearts. Baptize us with anguish, O oh God. Baptize us with cry that only can come from you, O oh Father. And also, baptize us with faith that we can believe that all things are still possible. Hallelujah. For those that believe. We love you this morning. In the name of Jesus, I pray.